Hey, good, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Data Engineers Lunch number 27. Um, I know we've been doing it for a little bit more than six months, uh, but it looks like we're gonna continue doing this for a while. Will, even though things are opening up, I think lunchtime is a good time to learn something new. Uh, today's topic, uh, yours truly will be talking about data processing with containers, uh, specifically you know, Docker and Kubernetes tools that are, are out there today for various purposes. Um, and uh, you know, we'll cover a few things that you may or may not know about, uh, but it's always good to see what's out there. Uh, I've got some great co-organizers on our team, always looking for co-organizers to help um, to get speakers, to get sponsors. Uh, I guess when we go back to in-person meetings now, somebody's gonna have to pay for the pizza. <laughs> data Community DC is a large community of data practitioners, diverse community and a large community of data practitioners uh, in the DC metropolitan area. And I was looking for diverse folks to from different backgrounds to come and talk about their experience with data. We're uh, several groups that have banded together as a nonprofit. What do we cover here? We, we cover a lot of different things around data, basically getting it together, cleaning it, for making it ready for use for something of more value, like machine learning, data exploration, or dashboards. So that means we, we cover the process, not a technology in particular. Uh, let's see, anybody new to the meetup or is their first data, data wranglers, data engineers lunch? Wanted to say hi. Anika, do you want to say hi? I'm an intern this year. Today's actually my first day. So I thought I'd hop on and learn a little bit about this kind of stuff since I'm super into tech. Great. Awesome. Welcome. Uh, Jack, do you want to say uh, hi a little bit about yourself? Hi, uh, I'm Jack. It's also my, my second week, actually, but it's my first week here at the Data Engineers Lunch as well. So super happy to be here and uh, learn something new. Cool. Very cool. I believe we know everybody else. Group rules share a question, just ask it, be polite. I use that as an opportunity to show what you know. Our company, Anant, uh, we help our customers and specifically people at our customers uh, build large scale platforms um, with real time data and analytics tools uh, like Kafka, Spark, uh, and Cassandra. Get us as a partner and a sponsor of this group. So is George, well, George Washington University is a great partner for all of uh, Data Community DC. We have a few local sponsors. Looking forward to getting into uh, some of the in-person meetups soon. Uh, we have organizational sponsors for for the for all of Data Community DC as well. Um, any announcements? Any upcoming meetups? Hackathons, conferences? Uh, Will, do you have any announcements from Data Community DC? Uh, uh, we have a cool event coming up next weekend, a data in government panel. I will uh, post a link to that in the chat in just a moment. That Great. should be very interesting. Yeah, I'll put it up on the screen real quick so people can see. Um, and I know we have Data Week DC coming up sometime this year, right? Yes, indeed. October 6th through 10th. Nice. Very cool. Yeah, definitely start uh, getting events on the calendar. So if you're interested in hosting an event, go ahead and get that registered as soon as possible. But that should yeah. be an awesome event. Very cool. Yeah. It's, um, do we know if it's going to be in person or if it's going to be virtual this year? Uh, the plan is for most of it to be virtual, but there, there, there are probably also going to be some in-person social events and happy hours. Great. That's awesome. And I'll post the data in government. There we go. Cool. Very cool. Thank you. Excellent. And uh, we have a few announcements ourselves. We're always hiring uh, data platform operators, engineers, and architects. Uh, you can check it out at carries.us. Uh, data Community DC, the link that I just showed you has uh, upcoming events all the time. 
uh, data wranglers DC. We're basically right now doing, doing this weekly um, lunch call every Monday. A um, couple of things coming up next week. We have PETL for data engineering. We have uh, migrating PostgreSQL to Cassandra that's coming up uh, on Wednesday. Um, and we have, uh, ooh, nice introduction to NiFi in a couple of weeks. Love that tool. Looking forward to that. And I'm going to get right into it. Um, so today's topic is uh, data engineering or data processing with with Docker and, and Kubernetes. Um, I want to warn you that this is not a hands-on um, uh, presentation because there's so much to cover, and it's really the broad strokes of of uh, you know doing data engineering or data processing with with containers. Um, so why containers? Well, they're uh, language agnostic. So uh, you know, if a container is is a packaged software uh, all with its own kind of requirements, dependencies, and it uh, given a process, it can execute it uh, the same exact way um, across different hardware. So it's hardware agnostic. It can run on virtual machines. It can run on the cloud, it can, it can run on different orchestration tools that are out there. Uh, it's framework agnostic. So that, what that means is that two levels. One is you could be using Django, or sorry, you could be using uh, PyTorch in one process, you could be using TensorFlow in another process. You know, same language, but completely different um, framework. Um, and it basically, doesn't matter because it's packaged in this kind of container. We'll, we'll talk about that in, in a second. Um, it's data agnostic too, right? Because technically, um, as long as you have a particular interface uh, for data, meaning the schema or the location for information, you, you know, you could have one process that's that's in Python, another process that's in C++, and as long as it's uh, containerized properly and you connect it properly, it will work. So a lot of, lot of really amazing reasons. Um, why containers are useful for data processing. Um, but I think the biggest one is that, uh, what I'm gonna try to get to is that there's a lot of really cool tools out now. <laughs> um, but even before all this tooling was out there, um, you know, there were various reasons. So um, anyways, Kubernetes is now everywhere, right? Why now? We've been doing data engineering on, on containers for a long time, but like, why now? Well. Docker uh, uh, had made it easy to write containerized processes, um, you know, when it first came out and became popular. Um, and to a certain degree, you know, doing it at scale was still kind of up in the air, you know, in terms of, um, in terms of, um, you know, do I use Docker Swarm? Do I use, can, you know, do I use Kubernetes? Um, so now Kubernetes is a standard, right? It's everybody's using it. It's 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 available everywhere. You can go to Amazon and get a Kubernetes cluster. You can get um, a cluster on AK, uh, AKS, right? Azure Container. Uh, AWS has EKS. Google has GKE. DigitalOcean has. I don't know, D, DKE, digital, uh, they all have their like Kubernetes, Kubernetes variants. Um, and then if you download Docker for desktop, it actually comes with Kubernetes. So like combining Docker with Kubernetes um, and now because stateful stats and, and data is becoming popular on Kubernetes, um, it's it's kind of like an ecosystem. Kubernetes is like an, is it like an operating system for large scale applications, but there are mature tools now uh, in a pretty, pretty rich ecosystem for how to do data processing also. And we'll take a look at a few of those. Um, and the rest of your platform is already there, right? You've got your Kafka there, you can do Spark there, you can do Elasticsearch there, you can have your web applications there. So your whole story, your whole narrative of how, of how data comes into the system and how it gets presented to the user, that's already there on Kubernetes anyways, depending on where you work. But it basically, um, Anybody who's anybody is basically um, leveraging Kubernetes for large-scale application deployments. Um, 
And until recently, I would say data was still, databases were still being done on native hardware or virtual machines. Uh, but I'm starting to see that people are more open to, to putting the data itself on, um, on containers or, or stateful stats, for example, in Kubernetes. So uh, basic concept, right? How do you use a container um, for, for data processing? Well, you know, it's not that much different. You're just refactoring your, your process into containers. So you still have to think about your data in, data out, what's coming in and what's going out. Um, and you take whatever your code is, whatever it may be, as is, and you put a Docker file in it, right? And so that Docker file can serve as a way to say to the container system, this is how I want my, my system to be built. So if you're running a Python process, um, you can say, you know, derive from the Python image, install my requirements.txt, and then run Python, and then here's my file. But you can have an environment variable that says, here's the location for the files, right? So what that does is it, it makes kind of like a function. Your whole process becomes a function where it's a, it has a name, it's a container name, and you can run that container anywhere once you publish the image, okay? And that means locally, once you test it and you push it to the registry uh, and it goes into your workflow uh, beyond your machine, it will work the same exact way. And so that's beautiful, right? Because you can have many, many people working on uh, a large scale ETL process or, or a data a, a machine learning process. And one person can be responsible for one data set. And their whole job is just to get the data and, and drop it somewhere, right? And the next person's job may be to pick that data up from three different places and, and do some transformation, do some processing, do some compute, and uh, dump it into um, a database. And another process could basically take it, make some averages, summaries, put it into another table that can be then visualized by an upstream, sorry, a downstream uh, visualization tool, right? Um, and there's plenty of, of, of stuff out there there's a, this link, I'm going to bring it up in a second, um, but basically it's Python ETL, um, but you can do it with, it has, it has a, a examples for Docker. Um, there's docker-etl, which is several different uh, ways that Mozilla Foundation uses Docker for ETL. NASA uses Docker for ETL. So a lot of people are doing that, right? You don't have to have anything beyond Docker to do ETL because Docker itself is just like, it's a container uh, it's a packaging system. It packages your software in a particular way that's reusable. And it helps you encapsulate complexity into a very simple box. So if, um, for example, source A is HDFS and source B is Cassandra and source C is Kafka, um, once it's containerized, right, and your only job is to put that data back into a very standard form, let's say, I don't know, JSON or Parquet or whatever, once it's done, the next person that picks it up doesn't have to really worry about how this has been implemented. So here's an example of a do-it-yourself ETL Docker data pipeline. This is actually one that I want to say has been 2013, I would say, almost. Um, yeah, six or seven years now. Uh, that was kind of one of the first ones that I that I was involved with the design and um, didn't have things like Airflow, didn't have things like um, Argo, which we're going to take a look at. Didn't Kubernetes was not quite that popular. Um, Docker Swarm was kind of edging in. Mesos, DCOS was there. And so we didn't know what the ecosystem was going to be. So we at least standardized the ingestion and transformation um, into containers. And each uh, process, for example, this was picking up from Heroku Connect. Uh, and by the way, these images were broken on purpose because they would expose a, a particular technology from a proprietary um, and a client. Anyways, I didn't want to get into that. But essentially what we were doing here was we're taking some data from Heroku Connect, transforming it, uh, just exposing it uh, running a simple process uh, before dropping it as uh, CSV. Uh, another one was just MySQL to CSV. Another one was a third-party API. BigCommerce was JSON, but we were processing it and putting it into CSV. Um, 
Cvent had its own API, HubSpot had its own API. We needed to transform it all to CSV. Some of these were written as literal uh, MySQL admin commands, like copy this into a CSV, like export it, right? Dump it, MySQL dump. Some of them were uh, JavaScript applications because they had a pretty good interface to that, that API, that JSON-based API. Uh, another one was a Java application that just had a SDK built by the software vendor that even though the, the API was available as a, a SOAP, right, web services, um, SOAP interface, it was also available as JSON, but their, their uh, SDK gave us object access and we would just bring it together and drop it as CSV. And that was put onto S3 and in a particular format. And our next step in the process, transforming it, doing some crunching on it, uh, we also uh, use different languages for uh, dockerizing the transformation from the pure CSV. Sometimes we were doing lookup and enhancing it. Um, and in each step, we were basically taking it from one place, dropping it into a, a different folder in S3. So the next, each step in the process was basically taking a file that it was expecting in a particular folder, it was processing it. And as it was processing it, it was deleting the file from that folder and archiving it in another place as it was continuing the process. And this is a super simple thing that you could do with just technically cron jobs and bash scripts, right? But once we put it into dockerized steps, then this then immediately became scalable because the Java application needed more memory sometimes. The, you know, lift and dump from MySQL was really not that, um, a, time consuming because that's like a C++ tool, right? And so the ingestion, we could say, run this every hour. The transformation, transformation we were saying, you know what, let's wait a few hours. And it was kind of rigged uh, using shell scripts, but it worked. And, uh, you know, we didn't quite yet at that time have the tech uh, or the know-how to run, and Spark on Kubernetes was not a thing. Spark on Docker we were playing with, but I mean, real, realistically, it wasn't mature. So we were still running Spark on EMR. Uh, we're using AWS native services uh, for, for the rest of the data. And once the data was, was published, it was available to the downstream applications. And the process was about the same for each of these steps. We took a process, we knew that it worked in code, we encapsulated it into a container, and we just said, take the data from this folder, drop it into this folder. And all of those were basically environment variables, right? What's my from directory? What's my to directory? And nothing fancy, but this thing ran for like three, four years without any hiccups. And then we reevaluated it for the customer and realized that at that point, there, there's other technologies like the Singer framework that was useful. Uh, there's other software as a service systems now that like can do a lot of this very, very cheaply. So we're able to basically get rid of this. You know, and then the transformation steps are still being used as, to a certain extent. The processing, advanced processing is still being used to a certain extent. Um, but it, it allowed the customer to basically choose a different way of doing something without breaking the whole thing. Um, there's plenty of examples. Again, when this thing is published on the blog post, you'll be able to see these. Um, but you don't have to new, you know, use anything special to run the pipeline. We were using shell scripts. Over time, we started to use um, Travis uh, or Circle CI basically to do the steps for us. Um, but you can use Jenkins, you can use Airflow, whatever you want, right? This is like back in the day, we didn't have much. We just had Jenkins and we had Travis. Now, around that time, Pachyderm came along and started to give a more formal way of doing data processing on containers. And, and now it runs on Kubernetes. But um, Basically, Pachyderm has two things uh, as a competitor to Hadoop, right? It basically has a file system, um, kind of like a Git for data sets. Anytime you, uh, you do any change, it does a copy on write. So when you add data, it copies the old data and has new data. It, ha it manages your versions and your schemas. Um, and then it has a pipeline system to essentially run containers on top of that data. But I mean, when it first came out, it was just a pure Dockerized system. Now it's, it, now it's all on Kubernetes, okay? Um, and I'm, I'm not an expert at Pachyderm, but I've just followed it over time. And it's 
kept up with it uh, in terms of the container world. And I mean, I know there's a commercial company that supports it as well, but it's open source and it's available. Um, and as you can see in this example, you know, it's Kubernetes running Dockerized Pachyderm. Pachyderm is essentially natively using S3 to store information. And um, they're running some, some processes for training and generating data with TensorFlow. Right? So this is for, for the ML stuff, but because it's Docker, you can have a Docker container just for doing ETL. And then once it's cleaned up, you can do some machine learning processes after that. Um, Pachyderm, great tool. I'm not an expert, but I, I know it's been around for a while. It's fairly mature. You see it in other tools, what I'm going to show you. You'll see that Pachyderm is one of those tools that people respect because um, of the general you know, um, structure that they have a file system that, that is useful for managing data and changes to data over time. Uh, uh, and this has been there before. Like, there's a concept of a, like a tree of tasks or a DAG. You can restart tasks. Uh, it has a UI, um, pretty, pretty solid. Of course, now I, I would be doing uh, you guys a disservice if I didn't mention Airflow with containers, but Airflow with containers are, that can mean different things, right? So you can have Airflow running on just a regular Python process, but then use the Docker operator to run the tasks. So that's one way of doing Airflow with containers. So the cool part is that your containers that you're talking about here, right? Doesn't have to be much different than what we're talking about. It could just be homegrown process um, that was containerized. I could use Airflow to do it, just like I would use Jenkins to run that Docker job. Um, and as you can see, you can use uh, Scala here, you can use R, it doesn't really matter. Um, Airflow is just running Docker run right, uh, for you. And, and Airflow can run kubectl <laughs> uh, apply to run something too, and we'll get into that. But Air Airflow is a high level tool. You can take your native Docker images and just say, hey, run this with the Docker operator, okay? Uh, you can also run Airflow on Docker. That's a different story. But what I'm trying to say is if you have Docker, why wouldn't you run Airflow on Docker as well? <laughs> Why make life complicated, All right? Um, here's an example where Airflow is being run. Uh, it's running uh, Dockerized processes. It can also run the celery workers inside Docker uh, because it's it's just there, right? When you're running Airflow on um, Docker, it can run the celery workers inside Docker as well. And uh, in this one, they have Livy running. That, that, that's used to basically talk to Spark, for example. Um, beauty of Airflow and containers is once you get it to work on your computer, your DAGs uh, are, 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 are saved properly. You can run the same thing elsewhere. So, you know, AWS Batch, Azure, Google, um, any type of Docker uh, container runtime, or nowadays open container initiative runtimes. Uh, Argo, uh, my, my new favorite, uh, next to Airflow. Um, and when I say next to Airflow, Airflow runs anywhere. Argo, you kind of need to have a container ecosystem. Airflow, you don't need to have containers. Um, so Argo project is hidden in a lot of projects that people don't know about. Uh, but Argo is a, a combined uh, two things. One, it's used for CI, CD. Meaning with GitOps, you, you commit your code, it can, it can pull the code, it can build your container, it can publish the image locally, right? Um, and then it can even run Helm charts for you by updating the Helm chart. It will say, oh, I've got a new image for this thing. So update the Helm chart to use that particular image ID. And it can just reapply the Helm chart to do Helm upgrade. So it can do the whole soup to nuts of building containers, publishing containers, using the published container on any software, not just data pipelines. You can use Argo to just host your web application. Um, the other cool thing that Argo has is that it has a native data pipeline manager where each of your containers can be part of a DAG, similar to Airflow, where you say, you know, I want these things to be done first before go, you go to the next step. Okay. 
And when you combine those things, right? If you do a, a, a code update to one of your containers, um, potentially you have to trickle that to your system. You may have to rerun the whole pipeline. Okay. And the other cool parts are uh, that I think uh, that are useful for for our for for production is that you can release some of your pipeline and try it out without impacting some other production process. And if it works well, you can just make that your primary process, not just your pipeline, your whole software deployment you can do that. Cool. Uh, Kubeflow is kind of the, the main um, poster child for Kubernetes and uh, data pipelines and data processing, um, machine learning, and it's got a rich ecosystem of, of tooling. It's supported on all the clouds. Uh, it actually uses Argo under the hood to do the, the CI CD stuff. Um, and has operators for, it's like airflow for machine learning on Kubernetes, right? So have these operators, you can say run the PyTorch operator here and run the uh, TensorFlow batch prediction operator here and run my uh, XG boost operator here, and it's optimized. It also has ways to run you know, notebooks and whatnot, but um, it's doing what you may need to do at a high level for everything soup to nuts from a from pure data, data science perspective. It, it is taking care of every one of those steps that somebody else has figured out. And um, a lot of knowledge from a lot of different people is in the source code, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. I can even serve up um, models for you once you've trained them. Um, so go back for a second, right? Everything you learn here is still useful. Just make your own container. You still need to do that for a certain ingestion and transformation. Then stuff like this helps you run it. Stuff like this helps you continuously build that container and publish it and to run it in a sequence. Stuff like this helps you leverage the best of the best in terms of machine learning tooling, machine learning engineering. It doesn't do your machine learning model creation. It doesn't like write the code for you, but it gives you the ecosystem to say, I can run this model locally on my machine and I can have the same confidence to run it at scale in production for a big company because that's what, it's, that's what it does. That's what, what Kubernetes does. Kubernetes runs software for large scale. So Kubeflow is uh, very popular. A lot of companies use it. A lot of companies use Argo as well. Um, and then Argo flow is basically how do you deploy Kubeflow with Argo? So Kubeflow has parts of it built with Argo, uses Argo internally. And then this is real meta. <laughs> Argo flow is a project that deploys Kubeflow uh, on these major clouds. So there, there are some cloud specific Argo flows. And you just pull it down and you say, I want Kubeflow deployed to Kubernetes uh, on Google, done. I want it to be done on AWS. Majority of the work has been done on AWS. I think they have these forks that are fairly um, current, but technically Kubernetes is Kubernetes. So if it works on AWS Kubernetes service, it'll work on Azure and GCP as well. Cloudflow uh, is fairly recent, and it's so recent that if you Googled Cloudflow right now, and it's a more dramatic effect. Oops. This is not what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, yeah, it's this one, cloudflow.io, right? So this is, this is so new that uh, right now, you know, when you Google it, um, shoes come up. So um, get back to this. So Cloudflow um, abstracts the um, stream processing in a way that you don't have to worry about, um, you know, which stream to use now versus in the future or which, uh, you know, framework to use now versus the future. You basically create um, reusable components for, for getting data, for processing it, splitting it, et cetera. Um, and then you can choose what to run that on. Now, right now, the main processes are 
uh, I believe Akka, Spark, and Flink on Kafka. Um, but what it's really doing is it's taking your, your, your logic and it's containerizing it and it's running it on Kubernetes. Um, Cloudflow is a project from Lightbend. Lightbend is the company that commercially supports Akka. And um, so it makes sense for them to, to, to work on something like this. Um, and I'm pretty sure this is what runs their new Akka serverless uh, platform. Um, but this is kind of the bleeding edge as, as I showed you, if the shoes for a particular name are coming up higher than the, than the, the technology, then maybe it's not the right bet immediately. Um, but it's worth looking into. It's worth keeping your, your finger on the pulse of what's happening. And that's it. Uh, th this is kind of the survey of what is available in the containerized world, um, starting off with do it yourself, right? Wrap it yourself, run it yourself to having a little bit of maturity in uh, data management at the file system level while you do stuff with uh, uh, Docker on top of it. So slightly better than this, us managing our own versions and where the data is, um, to better tools for, for managing your, your directed acyclic graph, to tools just purpose built for Kubernetes, to build and deploy software on Kubernetes, to machine learning and data processing software purpose built for Kubernetes to a deployment of Kubeflow using uh, the tool that was used to build Kubeflow itself. So that's it. That's, that's the presentation for today. And hopefully get some good discussion or questions around, uh, around the topic. Um, but uh, anybody else have experience with containerized uh, data processing or data engineering that you, you've seen? Uh, or has anybody been using Argo uh, or Kubeflow or Pachyderm? I'm curious to see who's, who's been using it lately. Everybody's shy today. Um, uh, any questions from anybody on what we just spoke about? I don't know if people are allowed to unmute. Do we have a security setting? If there is a question. Um, Huge pain, dependencies, and deploying and deploying software. Uh, Will let, left, Will left a, a comment. I just want to bring it up. Um, not to mention huge pain that is dependencies when developing and deploying a data related software. What's that? Postgres 12.x.x .x instead of Postgres 12.x.y that your coworker is using. Um, yeah, so what, what he's talking about um, was that when you're doing development, right, and you're using different versions of databases, um, when you when you use a particular container, it's the same container that somebody else is running. So there's no mismatches and dependencies. Uh, so that's huge. Yeah, definitely. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Will had to hop off. So that's that's quite okay. Well, if there aren't any questions or comments or use cases, uh, we can always wrap up early today. And uh, maybe in the future, we'll have demonstrations on some of these technologies. We've had several demonstrations on Airflow. Um, and I think coming up, might want to do some with Argo uh, and, and Kubeflow as well, uh, just because they're really cool software. Cool. All right, everybody. Have a wonderful uh, rest of your day in your week, and we'll see you next week, uh, same time, same place. Uh, remember, next week, we're doing PETL for data engineering here. And the following week is uh, introduction to NiFi, Apache NiFi. Take care, everybody. Have a wonderful day.